All right, so the second talk this morning is uh, Sheng Wei Liu uh, from Tsinghua University. And he will talk to us about quantum Fourier analysis for quantum channels. Take it away, Sheng Wei. Thank you, Dietmar. And uh, thank the organizer also for uh, organizing this very nice conference. And uh, it's a great pleasure to present this recent work at Harvard again. Um, uh, this is this. Uh, we will talk about quantum free analysis and somehow it's how it's related to quantum information. And just from the topic, you 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 may think about well, free analysis has a deep connection with information theory, and uh, this is kind of quantum version. And um, quantum free analysis, uh, we wrote a recent paper uh, with Arthur uh, Chunlai, Yunxiang, and Jinsong on this topic. And it's a general theory about uh, algebraic free transform and sometimes pictorial. And uh, we want to do some analytic estimates for those general free transform. And this, uh, our, the original motiv motivation is to study something like quantum symmetry, like subfactors or category theory. Now, in this talk, I won't talk about the most general version, but I, I will talk about the uh, part that most relevant to quantum information. So we really want to have a quantization of the application from free analysis to information theory. So this is a recent program we are working on. How do we use quantum free analysis to quantum information? And this talk is based on some recent uh, discussions with us, Jeffrey, Lin Zhe Huang, Jin Song Wu, and many others. And, uh, I won't talk about the most general mathematical results, but instead uh, uh, I will talk about the corner of the work that's most relevant to quantum error corrections. So before we go to the quantum error correction, let's start with a very beautiful result. I, I think this is so well known. It's called the pair from the serial. Uh, so I will start from here. We give a matrix, square matrix T, and suppose its entry is non-negative. And then the theorem says first there is an eigenvector V when this vector has positive values. And such that the eigenvalue is R, and R is the spectral radius of the matrix T. And it's actually the maximum eigenvalue. And uh, first Jake, of all, yeah. Could you turn on your video? Uh, I turned on the video. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Why okay. well, I use the note, I cannot share the video. So I, I will open the other video on my laptop, but I'm not sure whether it works. Okay. So uh, this is a very beautiful theorem and it's actually applied in Google searching engine and um, it's very powerful results. <laughs> in this theorem, uh, it has, some positive condition. First, the matrix is positive in the sense each entry is positive, and uh, the vector is positive means also each entry is positive. But uh, when we use the multiplication, the multiplication is the action of the matrix on the vector. So this kind of multiplication is not directly related to the positivity of the part of this matrix and the vector. So that's a kind of an interesting phenomenon, and. Um, in 1978, David Evans and uh, Hawkron, they have a quantum version of this from the theorem. They start with a complete positive map of von Neumann algebra. So here, the von Neumann algebra plays the role of the algebra generated by those vectors. So you can consider the vector as a continuous, as a function on points. So that generates a commutative algebra. And in general, we can look at this non-commutative algebra. And then we look at positive map on this algebra. 
And then they proved a similar result that there is a positive operator uh, such that it's an eigenvector with eigenvalue r. And once again, r is the spectral radius. And in both cases, uh, if we have some additional assumption, like if the map is irreducible, and then this eigenvector is unique up to scalar. And if the map is trace preserving, then the spectral radius is one. And then this eigenvector becomes the fixed point. Now, why do I think about this special case where it's trace preserving is uh, in quantum information, there is a central topic that's the quantum channel. And it's a, a trace preserving, a complete positive trace preserving map, CPTP map. And in recent days, um, people have a lot of uh, interest on such quantum channels. In only this, we pay more attention to uh, unitary acting on vectors. So that's a unitary quantum circuit. But since the real quantum system has a lot of noise, and now a uh, giant Prescott pr produced this word, NISC, noise in <coughs> intermediate scale quantum error. So we, we shall consider the system with a lot of noise. And so we shall consider the, the noisy quantum channel beyond the unitary quantum circuit in quantum information theory. So that's kind of the aim of this uh, talk. And, and why we are so interested in the trace preserving case. First, this is a natural condition for quantum channel. Secondly, when the spectral radius is R, then the eigenvector D becomes a fixed point. And that has a special meaning. That means the quantum channel can fix this data D. And this idea can be used in quantum error correction. And later we will see how we implement this idea. And there is a, a very useful result about the complete positive map. So given a complete so here for simplification, we consider the fundamental algebra to be finite dimensional. And the complete positive map can be written as in, in a special form in terms of so-called cross operators. It's a finite many operator fi in this uh, algebra m, and the action of the map complete positive map on D is written as this uh, conjugation of fi on D and fix R. This is a cross operator de decomposition. Now uh, let's read this uh, decomposition in a pictorial way. So this actually has a very nice pictorial interpretation. First, uh, we use the tensor network language. The matrix D is a two tensor that has two indices, like M, I, J. So you can consider there is an index I and index J on the two legs. And the matrix represents this. Uh, the, the, the diagram D with two legs represents this matrix. And the complete positive map is a map that sends a matrix to a matrix. So you can consider this horizontal action as this composition. And so this is, you can think about this as the usual way to write the quantum circuit of this double because we are talking about the action of a channel on a density, on a density matrix. And then after we take this computation, we still have two legs left, and that's another matrix. And uh, how do we understand this uh, cost operator decomposition? That means we can rewrite this phi, this diagram is four legs, it's a four tensor, as a sum of this kind of cap cut diagrams. So if you read the diagram, it's some operator fi multiplied d and then multiplied fi star. That's the this decomposition. So using this picture, then you can read just the single part, this complete positive map directly in this picture. And then it corresponds to this picture on the right. Now, the usual way when we take the action of map on D is the horizontal composition, like the direction of the quantum circuit. Now we take a, another direction to read the picture. We, take, we look at the vertical direction. You see, if you decompose the map as cross op operators, then this diagram is essentially a vertical reflection 
of the other. So this becomes an operator multiple as a join. So this is a positive operator. But actually, we can show the basic facts, but very interesting facts. If this map, this linear map, is completely positive, if and only if, if we read this operator in this vertical direction, that's a positive operator. So we call this operator in the vertical direction, the free transform of this complete positive map. And this operator also has a name that's, the, that's called the free multiplier in classical free analysis. And here is a quantum analog of that. So this is a big advantage because uh, in general, actually it's pretty hard to understand a complete positive map in operator theory. But it's very convenient to study positive operators in operator theory. So here we change this complete positivity to positivity in the free reduced space. And that's a big advantage to, to utilize. And the last thing is, uh, previously we considered action as a map acting on the density matrix. Now we consider this action in a different way. So this is the operator. The usual multiplication of the operator is also the vertical direction given by the indices. So this is a positive operator in vertical direction. This is also a positive operator in vertical direction. Now we are taking a horizontal composition. And we consider that composition as a second kind of multiplication as a convolution. And this is how we understand this picture using the idea of free transform. And then here we are essentially using the fact that the, uh, the convolution of two positive operators is still positive. And that implements the previous concept that this positive map acting on a positive operator is positive. So somehow we can reinterpret those ideas in a new pictorial way. And why this is interesting? First, this pictorial interpretation not only works for this map, like CPTP map on operator, it also works for the classic case. Like the positive matrix acting on a vector. And if we want to read that, then we can implement Jung's spin model. It's kind of one half of the tensor network language. And what's the idea of that? Uh, basic sites. Uh, we consider different kind of region. One is shaded, one is unshaded. And then we can put spins in the region. And if we have two different kinds of color in the same region, they have to be the same. Otherwise, the diagram is zero. And then we can read this diagram as a matrix in a horizontal direction. And this diagram has the index i as a vector. And then this horizontal composition becomes a matrix acting on a vector. And the vert uh, th this <coughs> vertical multiplication becomes a multiplication, pointwise multiplication of vector and pointwise multiplication of the matrix. And that's called Hartmann product. And this coincides with the classical positivity used in the classical pattern from the theory. So this is a very nice uni unification of both classical and quantum pair from Ethereum in this single picture. And actually, uh, our original motivation is to study this kind of phenomenon for a more general framework, like plane algebras. Uh, even more general plane algebra not necessarily come from subfactors. And the pair from Ethereum also works in a very natural way. <coughs> now, uh, we will discuss, uh, we won't talk about the most generalized method result, as I mentioned. Instead, we will discuss how to uh, think about this result in quantum information. So in quantum information, there is a very important uh, framework, that's the quantum error correction. So it's because of the existence of noise, if we want to run long-term quantum compute computation, then the quantum error correction is necessary. And the first quantum error correction code was constructed by Peter Shaw in 1995. It, it, uh, it corrects a single qubit error. 
And then in 1997, uh, Neil and Lafemi has a very beautiful uh, characterization of the existence of some quantum error correction code. So he gave a complete positive map E corresponding to the error. So here you can say, okay, it has a cost operating combination and each EI, each operating EI is kind of possible error appeared in the physics system, like poly operators or even joint like two qubit errors. And then if we encode some information in a subspace given by P corresponding to P, and then essentially we want to implement the following stuff. Given any qubits in the subspace, and we look at its density matrix, then this matrix lives in the subalgebra, uh, cut down by P. And then we want to show this map preserves the density matrix. So given this density matrix as an input, and then the error happened, it's a noisy environment. And then we want to construct a recovery map. It's another quantum channel. And such that their composition becomes an identity map of B. Then we recover the information. So that's the quantum error correction. And uh, their theorem said uh, for, pro for projection P, there is such a recovery map if and only if uh, this formula, this P E I star E J P is a scalar multiple of P. So this is a very beautiful result. Uh, somehow, if you have a projection and some error, you can check whether there is a recovery map just using this. Uh, using this uh, condition. And uh, usually this P has rank two to the K corresponding to K logical qubits. So this algebra becomes the uh, matrix algebra M two to the K C. And D is the density matrix of the N qubits uh, of this uh, state. And uh, it's a trace one positive operator. Now, in general, uh, say if we want to give an error, if we want to uh, construct some recovery map, so the composition is, is phi, it's quantum channel phi. And then we are interested in this fixed point algebra. This part is the information that can be corrected. So essentially, we want to have a larger fixed point algebra. Now, there is a very interesting observation. So if we want to encode more and more qubits, then essentially that we need to consider uh, the space given by the superposition. This is a bigger Hilbert space. And this additive structure, if we can take some sum of the space corresponding to the superposition of the states, and then for density matrix, that means we can take those corners. We can take those corners. So then we can have those uh, matrix algebra. So in that sense, if we want to have additive structure on the Hilbert space for uh, qubits, then we need to have a multiplicative, multiplicative structure for those density matrices, for those fixed point algebra. So in that sense, uh, for this fixed point algebra, we're not only interested in this space, just not only as a vector space, but also we want to study the multiplicative structure on the space. So we want to consider this as an algebra. In particular, we want to know whether this space has a copy of such matrix algebra to, to encode k logical qubits. Now, in, in paraform the theorem, we know that under certain conditions, the fixed point is unique. Uh, using the uniqueness, then that means uh, if we want to do quantum error correction, then there is only, only one state that we can implement, and then this is not good enough. So we want to encode more and more information. So essentially, we want to look at the fixed point algebra or fixed point space that is bigger, not just unique. So first, we want to understand this algebraic structure. And then there is a older result. Uh, they are considering, uh, by Troy and efforts, they are considering not a really a trace-preserving trace CP map, but a unital CP map. And then uh, they showed, given such a unit of CP map on phonemic algebra N, 
you can take an average of its power. And then this average essentially gives you a map from the original algebra to the fixed point. So this kind of average. Uh, it's not it's non trivial to show this actually is convert this actually convergence. Uh, and for this fixed point algebra, first it, sorry, for the fixed point space, first it's not really an algebra. And in their paper, they consider another multiplication, the circle multiplication. And it's defined in the following ways. We first take the usual multiplication of the two operators, and then we project this operator to the fixed point algebra. And then they show this operation, this multiplication is associative. So in that sense, this is an algebra. And somehow this is an indication, uh, maybe for the quantum channel for the fixed point algebra, there is an algebra structure. But uh, this circle multiplication is not good for quantum information since we need to use the original multiplication on this matrix algebra to encode the superposition of states. And also in their theory, the map is unital, but in our framework, we want to consider trace preserving map. So that's another different motivation. And here is a remark that this algebra was also studied by Masaki Izumi as the non commutative boson boundary. So that's another very interesting motivation why somehow this has an algebraic structure with this kind of projection. But in this talk, we want to show we have a, another algebraic structure using the canonical multiplication of M, and that can be used for quantum error questions. Now, uh, given a, now if we take a CPTP map, a, trace, a complete positive trace version map, a uh, finite dimensional polynomial, we can say just the map matrix. And then we we say this map has some cross operators. And we also take the average. And uh, first we know the fixed point algebra is just given by the image of this average map. Now let's take the identity. Let's take a special fixed point. We just take the identity and take this image. And this operator is a, uh, this, uh, this operator L is a fixed point and uh, it has say range projection P. This is maximum because this identity it's maximum, has maximum support. So this has maximum support. Then once this has maximum, then uh, if we want to consider the fixed points under this map, actually it's enough to consider another complete positive map given by the cut down by the projection P. Since all the fixed points lives in this sub-algebra PMP, all fixed points lives in the sub-algebra. So we can consider this cut down as a complete positive map and then look at the fixed point of this complete positive, positive map in this cut down algebra. Now, here is the interesting phenomenon. In this cut down algebra, we also take the cut down uh, cross operator Fi, and then we have three different algebras. First one is the commitant of Fi, the commitant A. The second one is the commitant of Fi star, called B. And the third one, which is smaller as the common of Fi and Fi star. There are three algebras. And then we show the fixed point algebra here is actually just the special operator L multiply this algebra A on one side. And the same, and also equals to the operator L multiply algebra B on the other side. So here we do get an algebraic structure in this fixed point space, but somehow modified by this operator L. Now, if we look at the smaller algebra C, this becomes much better. Then we have a subspace. And uh, in the subspace, first L commutes with C, and also for any operator L in C, this map, this multiplication map is a isomorphism. So this space decomposes as a tensor product. So that means in the fixed point algebra, we have this tensor product, the operator L and the algebra C. And C is a C star algebra. So how do we think about this in quantum information? We shall think about this L as a density matrix of some ancillary qubit. So that's something we, we shall drop. And the real information given by logical qubits 
is containing C. For example, if C contains a two by two by algebra, then we can use C to encode a single logical qubit. And L is an ancillary qubit. And there's some further stronger result if this range is identity, then actually A equals B equals to C. And the fixed point algebra is exactly this tensor product. So that gives a multiplicative structure. Now, uh, for this multiplicative structure, that's for the fixed point of this phi. And we are considering phi as a, co a composition of error map and the recovery map. And somehow we need to construct the recovery map. We know the error, but we need to construct the recovery map. And then we can show for just for any recovery map, the space we are interested in is this. This is part, the C, we can encode the logical qubits, the correctable information. And this algebra is actually always contained in another algebra. This, you see this is operator P, E, I, dagger, E, J, P. That's the operator appeared in the left, uh, near left lamp theory. Uh, this is actually contained in this, in another algebra. And this, the good thing is this algebra only depends on the operator E for the error. It doesn't depend on R. And then it depends on choice of P, the projection. And somehow we, we, call this, we call this algebra D. Somehow we want this algebra D to be large, the larger the better so that we can encode more information. Now as a concrete theorem, for quantum error correction, we say, given an error, that's a quantum channel with cross operator EI. And then just for any projection, just take any projection P, then we look at this algebra D. We have for any operator in D, there is a positive operator L, such that for any operator X in D, we have this composed map, there is a recovery map such that the composition acting on Lx is Lx. So that means D is preserved by this quantum channel. So that's for quantum error correction. So that means the whole space, the whole algebra here can be used to encode logical information that's preserved by the quantum channel. But there is a difference between this result and the previous result. There is a scalar. C inverse. It's a scalar smaller than one, and we can have an estimate of the scalar. It's bounded by the number of the cross operators. And if you compare this with the original theorem of Neil Leflin, in their theorem, they're actually saying this operator is a scalar multiple of identity. So that means this intersection is the whole algebra PMP. But in our case, we take any projection P, we don't have any constraint like this. This is actually a very strong constraint. It is non-trivial to construct such a P, but in our case, we don't have such a strong constraint. And then our results are just given any P, we just look at this algebra, the bigger the better. And then the output will be exactly the original output. So that's perfect for quantum error correction. Just the scalar is not one. And that means when we measure the result, that we have a probability to get it, that's C inverse. And this is not bad since uh, we can recover, just we can eliminate this fact just by taking multiple samples. And the number is somehow linear with respect to the scalar C. And this, we can prove theoretic, theoretically that C grows in polynomial rate with respect to system size. So this is totally acceptable. Uh, acceptable. So in summary, in this theorem, we just find a P, projection P such that this is big and that's enough. We don't need to ensure this stronger condition to do quantum error corrections. Well, that's kind of a recent thought. How do we use the free analysis idea to do quantum error correction for quantum channels. Thank you. All right, thank you, Zheng Wei. Any questions?
Um, hi, this is uh, Sean Tsui. Uh, just a question about your last slide, Zhong Wei. Uh, you said you get a good error correcting code. Uh, could you say um, how good it is? For example, uh, have you started the threshold or distance or something, something like that? Oh, so first, uh, this is a theoretical result. Like in this Laflam, uh, Neo Laflam theorem, it, it doesn't tell which code is good, but it said given a projection, how do you know? whether this can correct some errors. And here it's resulting in similar phenomenon. Given a projection, we can say which information can be corrected in this noisy system. And okay. then why we say this is good, this is good in sense, it's much easier to construct such a projection because in their approach, uh, you need to construct it such that this equality holds. Uh, it's, it's then trivial to check this condition. But in our condition, we don't have any constraint, any constraint on the projection P. Instead, we only need to check how large this algebra is. And this makes it much simpler to construct quantum error correcting codes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, any other questions? I guess not. Well, then, let's thank Shengwei again. <laughs>